Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain and as always with my brother and co-host Rahul Gosain. Today we're touching on yet another approval in the world of lung cancer. I feel like I say this almost every single time we're talking through these FDA approvals that the field is moving so fast. But this is the fifth approval in lung cancer and we still have a few more months to go in 2025. Today we're going to focus on Zongertinib, first oral TKI to be approved for HER2 positive lung cancer. And to touch on the study design, its findings, side effects, well, to look out for, especially sequencing, we're joined back by Dr. Joshua Savari from NYU Langone Cancer Center. Josh, thanks for joining us. Rahul and Rohit, thanks for having me. Always love discussing new therapeutic approvals with you guys. And I agree, it's an exciting time in lung cancer. Indeed, Josh, we keep bringing you back because you have been involved in all these pivotal trials. Congratulations for being part of yet another approval. Before we dive into BMEAN study, Josh, can you please briefly touch on the prevalence of HER2 disease in non-small cell lung cancer? And importantly, how are we defining this positivity criteria? Is it IHC or FISH or rather based off of ERBB2 mutation on NGS testing? Yeah, Rod, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of confusion in practice on what is a HER2 alteration. And I think it's important to sort of define three separate entities of HER2. The first and most common HER2 alteration is a HER2 mutation, the most common one being the YVMA, you know, exon 20 insertion. We pick this up by doing broad panel next generation sequencing. Now, we can also identify HER2 overexpression. And remember, that's protein overexpressed on the cell surface. There, if you look at high rates of expression, three plus, it's relatively rare, about 1% in non-small cell lung cancer. Just to make things even more confusing, there's also HER2 amplification, which can be identified by FISH or next generation sequencing. So it's really important to understand what mutation you're looking for, what alteration you're looking for, and to match patients to the appropriate therapy. Josh, thanks for laying that foundation. And it's important for us out in the community because HER2 stories started off with breast cancer where that HER2 IHC amplification is more important and we often don't see these ERBB2 mutation. Also, a lot of the approvals are based off that IHC and FISH amplification testing rather than ERBB2, whereas it's a little different when it comes to lung cancer. Josh, can you walk us through the study design and its findings for BMIN Lung 1? Yeah, so first off, HER2 mutation in lung cancer occurs in about 2 to 4%. We talked about the YVMA being the most common. The BME and Lung 01 study was a phase one dose escalation followed by the part 1B expansion study. And this was an important study. It's the first targeted therapy uh, to be looked at, specifically a HER2 specific targeted therapy. So it does not inhibit EGFR and it had multiple cohorts. What we saw presented by John Hamack from MD Anderson at the American Association of Cancer Research meeting in 2025 and subsequently published in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at three cohorts, cohort one, which were patients with pretreated non-small cell lung cancer who had HER2 tyrosine kinase domain mutations. What is a tyrosine kinase domain mutation? That's the active part of the gene occurring between exon 18 and 24, very similar to what we think about in the EGFR gene. We also looked at cohort three, which were pretreated patients with HER2 directed therapies, including and HER2, trastuzumab, deroxetecan. Cohort five were patients that had non-TKD mutations. These are mutations that occurred outside of the active machinery of the gene. There are other ongoing cohorts, including cohort two, which are treatment naive patients, as well as cohort four, which are patients with active untreated CNS metastases. And we look forward to seeing that data in the near future. This study, particularly in patients who had activating mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain who were treated with prior chemotherapy or immunotherapy, we saw a 71% response rate in this patient population, a complete response rate in that 5 to 6% range, depending if you look on the FDA label versus the clinical trial. And we saw a partial response rate here of about 64%. So we're seeing true 
targeted therapy response rates with this therapy. We also saw impressive median progression-free survival of 12.4 months and a median duration of response of 14.1 months. And I think, Rohit and Rahul, what's most important for me with this therapy is it's truly targeted, and we don't really see off-target toxicity, so very low rates of GI toxicity, very low rates of cutaneous or skin toxicity, truly making this a targeted therapy in the HER2 space. Thanks so much for covering that. You're talking about overall response rate of 70 to 75%. And this is in the population, as you stated, who did not get TDXD. And who did get TDXD, about 45% response rate. And those are very, very impressive. We'll have to see how the long-term PFS and OS data plays out here. Josh, in your clinic today, especially from the practical implications, when you have the options of Zongertinib approved along with TDXD, are you going to utilize this before TDXD or after TDXD? And also... Is CNS Mets going to play any role in deciding the treatment option? Yeah, great questions. I think you need to have a discussion with your patients and, you know, what are the current approvals in the HER2 mutation space? Well, we have NHER2, Trastuzumab, Deruxetecan, with about a 55% response rate and a median progression-free survival in the 9 to 10-month range. But remember, Trastuzumab, Deruxetecan has a topo-1 payload, a chemotherapy warhead, yep. and patients are experiencing chemotherapy-like side effects, yep. things like fatigue, potentially nausea, hair loss, you know, hematologic toxicity. And one toxicity that really concerns me the most is the risk for pneumonitis, although low, about 15%. Yep. It is a potential real toxicity. When we think about a targeted therapy or a true tyrosine kinase inhibitor like zongertinib, we talked about the efficacy data, about a 71% response rate. Like you mentioned, when you look at patients who had prior HER2 targeted therapy, including at HER2, you do see that mid 40% response rate. So for me, I'll be using zongertinib first prior to using and her to. Again, remember, these are all pretreated patients. Standard of care remains chemotherapy and immunotherapy or chemotherapy alone in the frontline setting. It's important to note that there are three ongoing trials potentially going to replace chemotherapy and immunotherapy. We are looking at zongertinib versus chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and that's the Bemian Lung 2 study. We're also looking at NHER2, trastuzumab, deroxetecan versus chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And lastly, there's another drug in development called Sevabertinib, which is a HER2 and EGFR exon 20 TKI. So, you know, like you guys said, this is a really exciting time in the HER2 space. But because zongertinib is more targeted, has less toxicity, does not inhibit EGFR, that would be my standard of care choice in the second line setting. Two things to reiterate. Whenever we have an actionable mutation in clinical practice, there's this thought of shying away of immunotherapy, but HER2 is one place where chemoimmunotherapy is still the standard of care. These agents are active in first line. And then second, Josh, you brought this up. The side effects when it comes to TDXD, we have to worry about alopecia, fatigue, nausea, and of course, ILD, because mortality is associated with this. But when it comes to zongertinib, any clinical pearls on how to manage some common side effects and what are we expecting here? Yeah, the most common side effects with zongertinib are diarrhea, and about 50% of patients report either grade one or grade two. Grade three or clinically significant diarrhea occurs in 1% of patients. So, you know, in a patient who has, you know, side effects of diarrhea, using Imodium can be a very effective strategy. The rate of cutaneous toxicity is quite low, but topical emollients creams are very helpful. Rates of paronychia are extremely low, and the rates of ILD or interstitial lung disease are zero. This is an important sort of advance for patients with HER2 mutation. And you brought up the idea earlier, Rohit, about CNS activity. And I think that's an important question in our driver mutation patient population. I think we need further data to better assess this. We saw about a 41% response in CNS, but these were prior treated patients. There is cohort four that is ongoing of active untreated CNS metastases. We know that NHER2 also has in that 30 to 40% CNS yeah. activity. So currently I would radiate CNS metastases up front prior to starting any systemic therapy, unless we have further data in the near future. 
again, tying in with the side effect profile patient share decision making is always the key aspect that we have to tie in. Josh, before we close, do we have any hint of zongertinib activity in patients with HER2, IHC3+, or 2+, for which are fish amplified, but rather NGS negative for ERBB2 mutation? And would you use this in your practice in your patients today? Yeah, this is a great question, and I get this question a lot, you know, particularly from community oncologists. We don't yet have robust data to say zongertinib, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, is active in HER2 overexpression. I think further data is needed. Those trials are ongoing, and we're also looking at the therapy in breast cancer as well as gastric cancer. For now, the approval is based on the tyrosine kinase domain or non-tyrosine kinase domain mutations. For those who have overexpression, 3 plus, the recommendation still is to use NHER2. 2 plus is quite tricky because the data for 2 plus with NHER2 does not look that great, in my opinion. Even when we're using TDXD with 3 plus, the response rate looks very different than what we're comparing with ERBB2. Something to keep in mind and setting that expectation for our patients. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, we're seeing 25, 30% response rates with the HER2 mutation. We're seeing 70 plus percent response rates. Absolutely. And you mentioned durability as well. True targeted therapies, I expect to see response rates north of 50% and a PFS north of nine months median. Hopefully with next generation HER2 inhibitors, we continue to move the needle forward for our patients. And again, just to read right before we close here that what you started off with, Josh and Rahul, you stated that the approval here is based on mutation. Josh, thank you so much for walking us through the treatment approval and talking about the implication in our clinical practice today. And congratulations for being part of yet another FDA approval in non-small cell lung cancers. We will eagerly await and look forward to bigger studies and more mature data in this particular space. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap from the discussion today. In today's episode with Dr. Joshua Sabari from NYU Langone Cancer Center, we touched on the accelerated approval of zongertinib for her 2 mutated non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer space. This is the first oral TKI to be approved in this space. Remember, HER2 mutation, which is ERBB2 mutation on NGS, turns up in about 1% to 4% of all non-small cell lung cancers. We now have TDXD and zongertinib approved in this space. Zongertinib showed close to 70 to 75% of overall response rate in patient population that was not exposed to HER2-directed ADCs versus close to 45% overall response rate if they had seen HER2-directed ADC previously. In BME and Lungo 1, the study that got Zongertinib approved, we're seeing median PFS of 12.4 months for previously treated patients. We also touched on the side effects and clinical pearls around diarrhea and rash, which are usually mild. Thanks for joining us today. Keep an eye out for other episodes on the new approvals, side effect management, and practice-changing data in oncology space. We are the Oncology Brothers.